determine what we were going to do, um, mentioned on Wednesday that uh, this week, presumably sometime, um, I can't seem to nail down the date. In fact, I keep getting different dates, but the uh, King James Bible will be 400 years old sometime, sometime this month in uh, May. I uh, saw May 2nd. May 5th, and yesterday, May 23rd. So which date it is, I'm sure a historian can nail down, but not that it matters that much. But I wanted to do something a little special. We're going to do uh, some of this uh, today, uh, this morning. Uh, actually, both services are going to revolve around some of this. But uh, also on Wednesday night, we actually are going to have cake, just so you know, for the uh, birthday of uh, the King James Bible. And uh, any of you guys, uh, a couple of you have mentioned it to me. We're going to have some testimonies Wednesday night about what the King James Bible has uh, meant to you, you in your life, and um, you can stand up on the fly and testify, or if you want to put a little preparation together, just, again, just a little bit, five minutes or whatever, guys, you're welcome to do that, but just want to uh, honor that, and maybe you uh, don't, I say maybe you don't, maybe you don't know who it is you're messing with here. <laughs> Maybe you don't know why, what kind of church you're in quite yet, but we're a King James Bible believing church. And, um, you know, you go some places, you read on the Internet, this church is King James, right? And sometimes you get there and you realize they're not as King James as you thought they were. So I want to go through something here today, and we've done this in part. As you know, I've uh, done quite a bit of study here this last couple of years, devoted a lot of time to some things. And some of this you may have heard before. Uh, if you've been here for a while, I can't uh, remember all that I've repeated, what I've not repeated. But I'm going to ask for some help this morning from a couple of uh, young men. How about we get our seniors up here, John and Caleb, or uh, Caleb and PJ? What if you guys would come and do me a favor? I'm going to have you uh, sit down there on the front row. I'm going to give one of these fine young men an NIV and one an ASV. If you want to take that mic over there and just sit down, and we're going to have you read so they can hear, okay? Um, I want to start out with something and show you just what the treasure is you have in the King James Bible. And uh, I know that most of you uh, know where some of this is we're coming from on. But uh, I want to show you just how far this goes, all right? We don't just believe the King James just insofar as it represents the Texas Receptus, Okay. I think the book you have is more than that for what it's worth, right? Let's uh, start. Let me just show you what I mean. Now, if you've, uh, most of us started out in the King James movement by studying uh, the difference between what Bible versions say, right? Even then, very few people have actually sat down with a King James and an NASV side by side and read at length and in detail of the changes, right? You go read any chapter in Proverbs with the King James side by side with an NIV, word for word, you will be remarkably surprised at what the changes are, okay? We all have in our uh, repertoire some verses to go to to show differences, but one of the most common things you'll hear is that new versions don't change anything. They do too. Look in John chapter 3. And for this, guys, whichever of you have the NASV, I know the NIV actually has this one right. Um, I'm going to show you something here real quick and then show you how deep this goes. And if you've seen this already, I'm sorry you'll be repeating it. But John 3, 36. Now, if you've got an AV, a King James Bible, go ahead and read along with me here and listen closely. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Right? Everything clear enough there? Two believes in the passage. He that believeth on the Son, he that believeth not the Son. Right? Let's have the uh, NASB reading there. PJ? It says, uh, he who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Okay. Is that the same? I know there are some minor wording changes, but two things. One thing. Uh, one believe and then one obey, right? Anybody here knows, and there are some, you know, we could talk at length about this, but anybody knows that when you put belief and obedience 
side by side, they're not the same, right? right? Here you have this passage. In one case, believe, but he that obeyeth not. That is not the same. Now, just so you know, King James Bible is absolutely uh, consistent with this. If you go back to uh, John chapter 20 real quick, and you don't have to turn to that, PJ, but I'll just tell you why John was written. Let me remind you of that, all right? John 20, verse 31. But these are written that ye might obey Jesus Christ. That's not what it says. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus Christ, Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through His name. Right? Yes. So when the NASB puts obey in John 3.36, it automatically kind of blocks out what it just said. Right? Believe, obey. King James says believe, believe. Consistency. Right? Inconsistency in that. Now look at something else real quick. Look at Acts 19. I'll give you another one. And we uh, have always had a fight, always had a battle with trying to lead folks to Christ, and they always come up with reasons to be trying to obey, to try to work, but folks. The issue in salvation in our day is what? It's faith and belief, right? Acts 19. Acts 19 and verse 9. And we'll read this in the AV first. And when diverse, that is, diverse people, were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them. All right, PJ, once more from you. Uh, but when some were becoming hardened and disobedient, speaking evil of the way before the multitude, he withdrew from them and took away the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tamarinus. Okay. Hardened and then obeyed. Your AV says they were hardened and believed not, Right. Versus hardened and obeyed God. Is that the same? It's not the same. Look in Romans chapter 11. Romans 11. And now just remember that nothing's changed in the new version. There's nothing significant that's changed in the new version, say they're scholars. Romans chapter 11 and go down to verse 30. Where we will read... For as ye in times past uh, have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. Even so, have these also now not believed, but through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he may have mercy upon all. Okay, PJ, and both PJ and Caleb in this one, for what it's worth. Right, I'll start. Uh, for just as you once were disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their disobedience. So these also now have been disobedient in order that because of the mercy shown to you, they also may now be shown mercy. For God has shut up all in disobedience that he might show mercy to all. Disobedience, 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 right? Every single one of those beliefs in the King James was disobedient to the NIV. And notice verse 33, what he said there. No, verse 32. <coughs> he said that God shut them up in disobedience. God shut them up in disobedience, right? King James, belief, 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 or unbelief. Him, or, it's not PJ, it's not his problem, but the uh, NASB, <laughs> unbelief, unbelief, or uh, disobedience, disobedience, and so on. Caleb, you too. All right. Just as you, who were at one time disobedient to God, have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound all men over, over to disobedience, so that he may have mercy on them all. Disobedience, disobedience, disobedience. Now, did they change the entire theme from belief and unbelief to disobedience and obedience? Yes. Yes, they did. All right, Romans 15. Just a few more examples here real quick. And then I want to show you why, and maybe you'll get some insight here that's needed. Uh, look in Romans chapter 15, and notice verse 31. That I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea. I'll just leave it at that. Go ahead, PJ. That I may be delivered from those who are disobedient in Judea, and that my service for right Jerusalem there, right? may prove Disobedience, right? Caleb? Um, pray that I may be rescued from the unbeliever in Judea. 
Okay, NIV in that case says an unbeliever, which is basically the same thing. PJs, once again, it's disobedience. The NASB routinely changes these verses where the issue becomes obedience, disobedience, rather than faith or, un- or unbelief, right? Look in Hebrews 3, and I'm not going to beat you to death with this, but there's a reason I'm hitting these uh, various verses here. First of all, Hebrews 3.18, let me read that. Hebrews 3.18, And to whom swear he <clears throat> that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Two unbeliefs there. All right. Uh, PJ. And to whom did he swear that they should not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? And verse 19. And so we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. Okay, so, again, in ASC, they have one unbelief in there, but one is disobedience, okay? So one verse is unbelief, one verse is disobedience. What kind of message does that send? Right? Uh, Caleb, why don't you read those two verses for me? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Okay, so again, one unbelief, but again, one disobedience, right? Look in Hebrews 4 real quick. 4, 6. Now, what numbskull idiot would say the two versions do not, you know, change anything, right? Anybody can see they're changing the uh, issue from faith to obedience or from unbelief to disobedience, right? That's wrong. Now, look in Hebrews chapter 4. And notice verse 6. Seeing therefore it remaineth that uh, some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered in, uh, entered not in rather, because of unbelief. Let me get you guys to read verse 6. 4 6. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter because of disobedience. Disobedience. Look in verse. Oh, Caleb, I forgot you. Go ahead. It still remains that some will enter that rest, and those who formerly had the gospel preached to them did not go in because of their disobedience. Disobedience. Again, right? Look in verse 11. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Here. Let us, therefore, make every effort to enter that rest, so that no man so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. Disobedience. Uh, PJ. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall through following the same example of disobedience. Disobedience again, right? We got a problem? Yes. Okay. You know, why do we have a problem? Well, the problem is grief. <laughs> In all those verses, uh, I'm not saying that all the NIV every time or the NASB every time turns faith into <clears throat> obedience or disobedience. Because it doesn't. However, in these cases, the reason it does is because of grief. And just so you know, in each of those cases, each of these passages we've read, each of those verses, each of those words changed is changed because of a Greek word called uh, Pietho, or ah, Pietho. And um, just so you know, in the King James Bible, as well as in the NAS, the NIV, uh, New King James, every single version there is translates this word now, just so you know. Pietho, in our King James, basically... Uh, it's either translated of uh, belief or obedience. Okay? Apietho, the A ah in front. Think of atheist, no God, right? Apietho means disobedience, no obedience, or no belief. And I want you to know that in the King James Bible, as well as those Bibles, as well as any Bible in English, Pietho, Apietho are routinely not translated. One way. In other words, this word does not just mean belief. It also means obedience, depending on context and all that stuff. It also, by the way, 
means to persuade, to trust, or have confidence. So the ah part means un or non. So to not be persuaded, to not believe, to not obey, to not trust. Right? Everybody clear? And the important thing here is that all new versions, as well as the King James Bible, routinely translate two different ways. Now, there's different ways, but we're only concentrating on two this morning. Obedience versus belief, right? Now, that should settle something for you. What does it settle? First of all, Greek is not a final authority. Because in Greek, if you translate from Greek, going to the Greek doesn't help you. Because sometimes in Greek, routinely throughout all versions, any version, this word is translated both obey and believe. Right? Yes. This word is routinely translated uh, unbelief or non-believing or non-obey or disbelief. Routinely, all versions, including the King James Bible. So, number one, the Greek is not a final authority. No matter what you study, who you study, you can go to Greek and you get no more light because you don't know which way to translate. Right? Now that said, uh, we looked at what the King James Bible did here with these words. And would you notice that in each of these passages, uh, the King James Bible is utterly consistent with context. All right? I mean, each and every time, it keeps belief being the issue. Uh, however, in the new versions, there's a general trend. This word, these words show up the form of this word, pietho, which is also, you know, pietho. Uh, that word shows up about 50 times in the New Testament for what it's worth. And uh, each time again, you know, it's not always just belief and obedience. Sometimes it's persuasion. Sometimes it's confidence. Sometimes it's trust. The point, though, folks, is the King James Bible, each and every time, kept the context consistent. In other words, the context was believed in the King James. But these guys tended to move back towards obedience. In other words, given a choice, the new versions tend more to move back to works and obedience than faith. Now, is your salvation by faith or not? Yes, it is. And look, I believe... You know, I believe somebody can get saved out of a new version. I really do. In fact, I know folks that have, okay? So, thank God, that's a testament to the fact that the gospel is still powerful, even though at times parts of it can be corrupted. All right? Thank God for that. But that's not the kind of Bible that I want, right? And in general, the new versions trend back to obedience, back to works. And uh, what do you do? What do you do to figure out what's right? You go to the Greek, but the Greek doesn't help because the Greek is confused. That is... Uh, the Greek is obscure and ambiguous in its own right. They all say that our King James Bible, there are parts you just can't understand without going to the Greek. Folks, the Greek is ambiguous. If you're reading along and you see Pietho, you would not know, just as a Greek student, how to translate it, either belief or obey, right? The Greek is not a final authority. So what does that mean? If the King James Bible is consistent and keeps the um, themes consistent, what does that mean? Well, let me ask you this. How is it that your King James Bible is not superior to the Greek? <laughs> they say, well, uh, Ruckman and Stevens and Ripplinger and Gipp and all those people say that the uh, English corrects the Greek and uh, we don't say it corrects the Greek. However, I believe you get more light from the English than you would the Greek. How would going to the Greek help you in this? You have no clue. You would get a listing of words of what it might mean. And you still would not know what to do. I don't care if you do have 10 years of post-high uh, school Greek in your, you know, on your shelf. I don't care. It still doesn't help you. How is it? How is not the King James Bible superior to somebody that just has Greek with Pietho, not Pietho. How is it not? And that's what I hold to be true. I hold that you get light from the King James Bible that you do not get from Greek or Hebrew. Amen. And uh, I spent, for what it's worth, I spent quite a bit of time here the last few years trying to, you know, to search that out. Believe it or not, 
I uh, haven't spent the 30 years that I've been in the King James camp just, uh, you know, cowering in the corner, hoping that somebody will tell me what's right to believe, just waiting on Ruckman to, to say something else out of his mouth so I can believe it. I've actually spent that 30 years in the King James camp searching out some stuff, trying to figure out some things because I had questions about this stuff. And you're always hearing, you need the Greek, you need the Greek. Went to Romania. It was 10 years ago now, or more. Went to Romania, and uh, in Romania, walked into a guy's house, Christian guy, Romanian Christian, and uh, lo and behold, there sits a professor that's also in Romania just doing you know, mission work from Central Seminary. <laughs> I was thinking, oh boy. So he said, I started talking. He said, while we're here, you know, I'm here uh, teaching the Romanians Greek. Because, Pastor, you well know, you can't really prepare a sermon and preach and teach the Bible right without going to the Greek. Uh-oh. <laughs> so I'm telling you, you know, these guys go to another country, another language, and try to teach them something that's not even true. Yeah. Right? The Greek is not a final authority. No. It doesn't work out. I'll show you some other examples of that. Let me give you another example. Guys, if you would turn with me to Luke chapter 23. And again, I've lost track now. I've I've taught some of this uh, in part here before and uh, taught some of it other places. So I kind of lost track of exactly what I've taught, what I haven't. If I'm repeating something, I'm sorry. But Luke 23, Luke 23, verse 33. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the malefactors, one on the right hand and and the other on the left. Okay, guys. And when they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. All right, you have a King James Bible, and you're turned to uh, 20, Luke 23, 33, right? You are looking at the only verse in the Bible that has the word Calvary. Yeah. The only verse in the Bible. You notice their Bibles, NASB, NIV, do not have Calvary in the verse. I want you to know that the New, the, the New International Version, the New American Standard, do not have the word Calvary. Now stop and think about that for a second. Think about the power for a minute of the Word of God, okay? Um, you know, when uh, everybody recognizes the Coke symbol, the Nike swoosh, you know, uh, the Pepsi symbol, everybody knows what those are. Anybody knows what the golden arches are? All the way from here through China and Australia, okay? You know how many trillions of dollars have been spent to put those symbols in the minds of the public. So when they see the Coke symbol, they know it's Coke, right? When they see the McDonald's uh, golden arches, they know what it is. And the reason is because how many hundreds of billions have been served. They've advertised for years and years and years, spent millions and perhaps trillions of dollars to do it, right? Everybody knows what a Nike swoosh is, right? Let me ask you a question. Thinking of how much effort goes into advertisement, marketing for those sort of products. And everybody recognizes it. I understand. Think about the power involved where in only the King James Bible is the word Calvary found. It is mentioned one singular time. You go through your songbook and find how many times Calvary is mentioned. You know, Calvary is so pervasive if that's the right word for it. It's so uh, throughout our society that how many times have you heard somebody say, somebody gets in trouble, well, call in the Calvary. <laughs> you know, that's the wrong thing to say, right? You mean call in the cavalry. A cavalry is not the same as Calvary, right? But it's so ingrained in Americans' minds, Calvary, the idea of Christ dying on the cross, that when somebody says that about you know, uh, you know in, in passing, about calling in a troop of horsemen to rescue me, they say, call in the cavalry. 
It is that persuasive. Now think about how powerful the Word of God must be. That one mention in one version so pervades the English mind that folks even make a mistake in common speech about it, right? And think how many songs have been sung. Think how many times today in new evangelical churches where they read Bibles that don't even have Calvary in it, a pastor will make mention of Calvary. Think how many Calvary chapels there are. Did you know that Calvary chapels don't believe the King James Bible? As far as I know, they don't even use the King James Bible, right? Yet, in their, their Bible doesn't even have the name of their church on it, and yet they're Calvary chapels. <coughs> Think about that. Now, the word uh, Calvary, the Greek word for Calvary is actually cranium. We get the word cranium from that meaning, of course, your head, the skull. So, four times in uh, the New Testament, it's mentioned that Jesus Christ was taken to cranium. One time in the King James Bible, Luke 23, it's, it's translated as Calvary. Okay? The other three times in uh, Matthew... Mark and John, it's a place of the skull. Again, right? Now, again, the new versions have taken Calvary out altogether. Okay, it all comes, all three cases. Now, think about this. You're a King James Bible translator. You are very, very, very adept at Greek and Hebrew. So, you're sitting on one of the translation committees that is translating the New Testament from Greek. And you read Matthew... Cranion, and you translate it to place in the skull. <coughs> and then you read Mark, Cranion, and you translate it to place in the skull. You read John, Cranion, and you translate it to place in the skull. You read Luke, Cranion, and you translate it to Calvary. <laughs> Were the King James translators senile? Would the guy not realize that he just translated it um, place of the skull and Matthew, Mark, and John, but he gets to Luke and he translates it Calvary. Are they senile? <laughs> I mean, the 14 times each and every translation, each and every verse has gone over, reviewed 14 times in the King James Translation Committee. So 14 times these passages went through that committee. Cranion, place of the skull, place of the skull, place of the skull. One time, Calvary. Now tell me this, folks. How do you explain that? First of all, how do you explain that some of those most eminent minds, some of the most eminent scholarship that the world has ever seen somehow manages to let that slip past them? They've translated it, place of the skull, place of the skull, place of the skull, but now it's Calvary in one place. How do they do that? Why would they do that? I'll present something to you. Do you think God might have had anything to do? Is it just possible that the Lord Jesus Christ might have been interested in that translation and he may have translated it that way for a reason? But is it not remarkable that all the new versions take it out? I believe it's actually in the New King James. But most all of the new versions almost universally take it out and remove from circulation a word that is found over and over and over again in theology, in songs, in church names. Can you explain that to me? You think God might have been involved in the King James translation? Yes. And do you think that the power of one word mentioned one singular time in all the Bible uh, can't be found anywhere else, and yet it finds its way into hundreds of songs? finds its way into thousands and ten thousands of sermons. People name their churches Calvary Baptist Church that don't even believe the King James Bible. It's not even in their Bibles. How is it that God, with so much power, could put that within the subconscious of people's minds, yet along come the new versions, trot up and change the Bible? Right? So my question for you is, do you think that the Lord might have had something to do with the King James Bible in that respect? Do you think the Lord just might have clean, cleared something up with this whole obey, believe issue? Because it wasn't clear in Greek. This is not clear in Greek. It's clear in English. 
Mm-hmm. Right? You get something out of English that nobody ever gets out of Greek. Go check it out. I'm trying, you know, I tell you what, if you walk up to a Greek, Greek professor at uh, a Central and ask him this question, I'll tell you what, he's not going to give you the answer that I give you. I'll tell you that right now. But I'm telling you, I believe God did something in the King James Bible that he did not do in Greek. Therefore, you going back to Greek is a trend backwards in the darkness. Because you got more light from English on this and this and this than you did in Greek. So, as opposed to last week, God's marketing campaign worked just fine. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, amen. All right, look here. Look at another one here. Look at Daniel Daniel 1. And um, I want to cover a few of these. And again, <coughs> what happened is I started digging for this stuff uh, oh, years back. And um, finally started sitting down writing two years ago and decided to tell Brother Gip about it, ask him what he thought about some of the ideas. And uh, he said, you know, if you're going to write this book, uh, you're stupid. And he used that word, stupid. You're dumb not to go ahead and write the book, but write it for a master's thesis so you can go ahead and get your master's. So out of all that was more in this idea of writing this book, the, the idea of writing the book came first because I've been researching this stuff. And uh, after that came the idea of going ahead and getting the masters along the way. So that's what's sitting on Doc's desk right now, and I'm going down in May to uh, receive the masters, presumably, uh, unless we have another earthquake and I can't leave town. <laughs> but uh, bottom line is, for what it's worth, I mean, for the better part, folks, of 30 years. I've had questions, and I've been searching, and just, you know, I don't play with Greek and Hebrew all day long like some guys do. But occasionally something would come to mind. I'd see something in the Word of God and go back into Greek and Hebrew and just see, you know, if the King James Bible did something that could not be done in Greek and Hebrew. And folks, I'm telling you, it happens all the time. There is nothing but confusion and darkness in Greek and Hebrew. Got news for you? If God didn't do something in translation from Greek and Hebrew to English or any other language for that matter, i got news for you. It doesn't come across. Yeah. It doesn't come across in complete, precise accuracy the way that... And I've got, can't, got to stop there or else I'm going to go off into the morning sermon. But <laughs> look, in, uh, look in Daniel 1 real quick. I want to show you another situation where in only two places in the Word of God is something found. Daniel 1. Daniel 1 4. These are, of course, the uh, four Hebrew children um, that are captured out of the, uh, Israel and go off into captivity in uh, Nebuchadnezzar's uh, Babylon. Notice verse 4. Children in whom was no blemish, but well favored, and notice skillful in all wisdom, and cunning in knowledge and understanding. Notice the word science. Now, Caleb and PJ, y'all hang on to Daniel 1. And y'all can turn to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6 as well. 1 Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy 6 and verse 20. And having read these two verses, you will see the only two verses in the Word of God that contain the word science. Now, before we read it, you do realize what's happening in our world, right? You do realize that the world now has this uh, preoccupation. Uh, Even um, Greek scholars, psychologists, psychiatrists, anybody, anybody desires to get the word science attached to what they do. Because if it's scientific today, the devil has sold us the idea. If it's scientific, it's got to be true. Evolutionists have labored for 100 years. You know, it's science, it's science, it's science. Therefore, it must be true. Psychology today is considered science. Therefore, it must be true. Right? Uh, Greek scholars have labored for years and years to make a Greek translations and a translation from Hebrew, more and more of a science, because if it's a science, it must be true, right? What do they say to you when you say you don't believe evolution? 
Well, you're not very scientific, right? That's what they've sold. If it's science, it's true. Now, with that in mind, 1 Timothy chapter uh, 6, verse 20. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so-called. Once again, guys, in your new version, sir. Youths in whom was no defect, who were good-looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, and who had ability for serving in the king's court, and he ordered him to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. Do you hear the word science in there anywhere? No. It's knowledge. By the way, did you notice they were good-looking? Good yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Caleb, go ahead. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. No he science, was. right? They were handsome, though. They were good-looking and handsome. Look in 1 Timothy uh, 6, 20. And guys, read that last, uh, last half of the verse. You can find a place to start in the last half of 1 Timothy 6, 20. Remember the oppositions of science. False so called. Turn away from God turn away from godless ch- chatter and opposition ideal of what is falsely called knowledge. Okay, knowledge. It's not science in first Timothy six, it's knowledge. Go ahead, uh, PJ. Avoiding worldly and empty chatter and the opposing arguments of what is falsely called knowledge. Falsely called knowledge. Now, I want to point out something to you here. In the King James Bible, uh, God, all the way back in Daniel, back before, back in B.C., and then again in about, oh, 60 A.D., God, in the Word of God, prophesied to you there would one day, one day be an issue with something called science. People call it science all the time. Did you notice that God... Uh, uh, pre invented uh, some things. For instance, did you ever notice that when uh, Mary is seen with Jesus Christ, the, Jesus Christ's mother Mary, when, he's, when she's seen with Jesus Christ, anywhere in the Word of God, Jesus Christ is not following her around, hanging on her skirts and going, Mommy, Mommy, Mommy. And she, you know, in fact, some of the times that you see them together, he's kind of curt with her, right? I mean, uh, woman, behold thy son, right? Those sort of things. Uh, these, uh, behold, your mother and your brothers and your family, if they're here to see you, behold my mother and my, and my brothers, right? Talking about the people that were there listening to us. The idea is that the implication in the Bible is that Christ was kind of curt with Mary. And all it is, folks, I don't doubt for a minute that Mary and Jesus Christ had a, a loving relationship, right? But what God foresaw was that there would be a day that a bunch of people rose up and tried to make Mary a god. And so he did not give them any leeway to do that. If they're going to have to do that, they're not going to use the Bible as an excuse. They're going to have to go outside the Bible and make up fables about Mary, right? God foresaw that. He foresaw a lot of things, and he foresaw the idea that there'd be a day that folks would absolutely fall at the feet of anything called science. Now, I want to show you in Daniel 1 something. I want to show you that in showing up in the Word of God only twice, science, God defined the issue for you. In one case, science is good. Look in Daniel 1 4. Children in whom was no blemish but well favored, skillful in all wisdom, cunning in knowledge and understanding science. Now, you know what you don't find in there? You, you find that God used. The science, the knowledge those kids had, right? Secondly, you recognize the fact that it separated the difference between science and knowledge. But God used the scientific knowledge they had, right? So there is a science that God uses. There's a science that God recognizes. On the other hand, 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6, verse 20, a book largely written in part, at least anyway, for the last days, the latter times, Notice chapter uh, 6, verse 20. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, <clears throat> avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so-called. And again, what you see here is that 
this science here is the polar opposite of the science in Daniel. Right? This is not the same kind of science. God does not honor this kind of science. It is a science to be what? Avoided, verse 20, avoiding profane and vain babblings and the oppositions of science, falsely so-called. I mean, uh, this science opposes real knowledge. And furthermore, uh, it has a false name. It's not even science. It's falsely called science. It is not godly. It's not right. My point in saying all that is the only two places in the Word of God you find the word science. You do not find the word science in those versions. As well as the RSV and all that sort of stuff, right? You do not find science in those versions. Now, so you know, again, let's go back to the Greek and Hebrew. The uh, Old Testament, of course, is in uh, Hebrew. And the Hebrew word that uh, the King James Bible translated as science from Hebrew in Daniel 1 was Mayada. Mayada. Mayada shows up in the Old Testament four times. Four different times it is called, it is translated knowledge. Except in this case, it's translated science. So the King James Bible is inconsistent. Yeah. Like all the rest of the versions are, by the way. And in the New Testament, in the New Testament, the word science in 1 Timothy 6, comes from a Greek word spelled something like this. Gnosko. To know. Gnostic, to know, right? Gnosko. 28, no, it shows up 29 times in the New Testament. Each time, 28 times, it is translated knowledge. Except for one time. When it's translated science. In First Timothy six twenty, so the King James Bible is inconsistent. Tell you what the King James Bible did for you. It defined for you the issue. Yeah. The exception in Hebrew. The exception in Hebrew was the one time that you could see this was the knowledge of God that God wanted you to see that Daniel had the kind of knowledge, the kind of science God would use because God knew there was coming a day. When it's science, 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 science. Everything is science. Evolution is science. Uh, psychology is science. Uh, <clears throat> peanut butter parfaits, those are science too. Everything is science. Science, science. If it's science, it's good. It has to be good if it's science. A science told us that the uh, uh, Gulf of Mexico would be destroyed by this oil spill. It wasn't destroyed. Remember the big uh, Exxon Valdez thing? On the whole coast up there in Alaska, it's going to be destroyed, says science. It wasn't destroyed. It's back to normal. It's pristine. Fish live there. Penguins live there. It's a good thing. But in the name of science, it must be true. And I want you to know, God foresaw the day in Hebrew that you would need to know what good science is. So he showed you. The only way he showed you is how? By translating that one time, science from the Hebrew instead of translating it knowledge from the Hebrew. That is, in, from Hebrew to Greek, or from Hebrew to English, in the Old Testament of Daniel 1, you get light in English that you would not have got in Hebrew. Because in Hebrew, you would have never thought to translate it science. They all translate it knowledge. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. New Testament. 29 times Gnosko shows up. 28 times it's translated knowledge. But God foresaw a day that you Latter-day Saints would... And I don't mean Mormons. (laughs) Thank you very much. Yeah. You Latter-day Saints, you would need to know a science that's bad. You would need to be able to go back and see a science that's good, and you would need to know a science that's bad. If you only had Greek, he wouldn't know. Because he would translate 1 Timothy 6.20 as knowledge, like they did. Instead, God translated it science. Went against all convention, right? Translated it science. So you would be able to recognize as a name something God was against. You get information in English that you do not get in Greek and Hebrew. 
God showed you something in English that God could not show you in Greek and Hebrew. You get light in English that God would not show you in Greek or Hebrew because it's not there. Yeah. I'll ask you this. Who's responsible for that? King James translators. King James translators. Fourteen times it passes through their review that we've translated this word inconsistently, this word inconsistently, this word inconsistently, these words inconsistently, and still pass through their translation committee. Were they senile? <laughs> Were they stupid? Could they not see they translated it some other way real nearby? Or did God direct them in a way that they maybe didn't understand? You think those guys might have sat down before each of those days that they translated and said, Lord, God, please guide us. Dear God in heaven, please help us to uh, do this right. We're doing this for the king. We're doing this for the English-speaking people. And we hope this translation might be something special. We want you to work through us. We want you to use us. We want you to guide us. You know what? There are preachers that pray that. I pray that. And you know what I hope? I hope he does. And you know what? If I deem that he has, I'm happy to say thank God for it. You know what? It's not a heresy to pray that God would guide you. Is it a heresy for a translator to pray that God would guide him and then for God to guide him? The Texas Receptive scholars say yes. Your Alexandrian scholars, the guys that translated those Bibles, they say yes. Because they said that God inspired the originals, preserved the Greek and Hebrew manuscripts. But it is absolute abomination. It is heresy to think that God would have guided translations in any way, shape, or form. Because after all, that would mean you were re-inspiring the Bible. And that's not true at all. Look, again, point is, all this escapes the uh, translator's attention, I suppose, unless they were really, really smart. Maybe we should just lay this at the feet of the translators and say, boy, those translators were so smart, they saw that we needed a definition for science in the Old Testament and a definition for science and a warning in the New Testament, and they just were so wise... And so prudent, they saw all these issues, and they also did this. And they also did this for a reason. They were so smart, so foresightful, that they did it. They were boys, they were so smart. Look, if that's the case, if the King James translators were so intelligent, so smart, so foresightful to be able to do that, then I think that we should quit tearing them down. I think we should just lay down at their feet and say, boy, the King James translators are way too smart for me. And those guys over there are idiots. Not P.J. <laughs> but the books that they hold in their life, the, the translators that translated them, those were children in the nursery. The King James translators should be trusted at all costs for the, what they wrote down because plainly, their scholarship is so above everybody else's that it's just unimaginable. You know what I think? I think that's not the case. I don't think that those guys with all the things they were dealing with, all the words they translated during a day, all their review process, I don't think for a minute they knew what they were doing completely. I think they did the best job they could. You know what I think? I think that God directed them. Yeah. Yeah. I think God directed their translation so that they translated certain words sometimes inconsistently and God blessed the inconsistent translation to show us something you couldn't have gotten from freaking Hebrew. Yeah, amen. Now, you know what? You can go to Pillsbury Baptist Bible College or Central Seminary. That's what they're not going to teach you that. <laughs> they don't believe it. Okay. I'm really sorry. Like I said, I, I'm not real smart. I could have never been a translator. Uh, my mind is more like a 1979 F-250 pickup truck. <laughs> <laughs> it's rusty, it's slow, and it ain't pretty. Aww. You know what, though? I can still read now, I'll take something and think about it for a few weeks or months or years. And Lord willing, eventually come up with some sort of conclusion. And this is what I've come up with. Yeah. And there are lots of things like this, folks. Uh, let me give you a... Do I have time for this? Yes, I do. One more quick thing. Let me show you the master at work. Look in Revelation 22. And there's some more stuff we could do here. Let me show you the master at work. By the master, I'm not talking about Jesus Christ. 
I'm talking about the devil. Revelation chapter 22 and notice verse 16. Who's speaking here? I, Jesus, right, have sent mine angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am, Christ is, the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Amen? Isaiah 14. Isaiah chapter 14. This is the most blasphemous thing that's been done in the new version. Isaiah chapter 14. This is blatant, in your face, deceit. Remember, the devil winds up deceiving the whole world, right? Isaiah 14, and notice verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Notice, son, S-O-N, of the morning. It's not a morning star, right? It doesn't say morning star. It says son of the morning. Guys, I need you to read the first half of Isaiah 14, 12 for me. 14 or 15. I'm sorry? It's, uh, how you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. How art thou fallen from heaven, O son of the morning? Right? Is that what it says? Son of the morning? Star of the morning. Star of the morning. Christ is the bright and morning star. Look in, uh, go ahead with the NIV there. Yeah. How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. Now, there's two things that were done there that you should take note of. These are profound monumental things. If you uh, were a thief and broke in here and had the sense to do it, if you managed to somehow get in the safe, managed to crack the safe, and if there was any money in there and you got away with it, if you had any sense at all, what would you try to do? You would try to wipe the fingerprints off of anything you touched, right? You would try to erase your identity. Would you notice Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12? Can you find in the new versions... Satan's name in that verse. He has removed his identity. Lucifer is not in the verse. Right? And then he did a, something, a second thing that was profoundly monumental. He replaced his name, Lucifer, with a title for Jesus Christ. Star of the morning. Folks, that is wretched. That is blasphemous. Now... You say, what is the reason for this? The reason for this, and let me just, well, I'll write it up here. The reason for this is, yes, Hebrew. The word that the King James translators translate as Lucifer is a Hebrew word, Haleo, or something to that effect. Now, uh, let me read you, let me read you what the experts say. Here's a guy named Adam Clark. His commentary is quite uh, common, very famous. And he's commenting on Isaiah 14. Here's what he says. Uh, O Lucifer, son of the morning, which is what he's commenting on. The versions, in general, agree with this translation and render Haliel uh, as signifying Lucifer Phosphoros, the morning star, whether it was Juniper or Jupiter or Venus, as these are both bringers of the morning light or morning stars. Um, and although the context speaks explicitly concerning Nebuchadnezzar, yet this has been, I know not why, applied to the chief of the fallen angels, who is most incongruously denominated Lucifer, the bringer of light, an epithet as common to him as uh, those of Satan and the devil. That the Holy Spirit, by his prophets, should call this arch enemy of God and man the light bringer would be strange indeed. But the truth is, the text speaks nothing at all concerning Satan. It speaks nothing at all concerning his fall or the occasion of that fall, which many divines have with great confidence deduced from this text. Oh, listen to this. Oh, how necessary it is to understand the literal meaning of the Scripture. What do you mean? He means Hebrew. 
Oh, how necessary it is to understand the literal meaning of Scripture that preposterous comments may be prevented. He's calling the guys that have deferred and said that Lucifer is the devil and Satan fallen. He calls that commentary preposterous because they don't agree with him because they didn't go to the Hebrew and get what he got. I doubt much whether our translation be correct. There is... uh, There's another guy here that I was going to quote, but I won't bother. My point is, folks, uh, you have here, you go to the Greek, you go to the Hebrew in this case. What do you come out with? You come out with something different. And then you hide Lucifer's identity. His name is removed. It's not him. And you put in another name that is Jesus Christ's name, solitarily. That is blasphemy. Right? Yeah. Now here's the difficulty. You go to the Hebrew, and Hebrew is your final authority. You come to this word here. And the King James translator is translated as uh, Lucifer. Uh, you look at that word, so you go to your uh, uh, Hebrew lexicon to find out what that word should be. Here's all the things that word can mean. To shine, uh, to flash forth light, to praise, to boast, to be boastful. Um, to glory, to make one's boast, to be made a fool of, to act madly, to act like a madman. Which one are you going to choose? You're a Hebrew scholar. You have a Hebrew word. You've got to translate it. Which one of those words are you going to use? Lucifer is not in there. But the King James translators were led to put Lucifer. Look, folks, you read the passage. Anybody can figure out that the devil. It's just not that hard, right? It's not a, a big theological thing. That is the devil. And his name was Lucifer. Only you wouldn't know the name Lucifer if not for the King James Bible. Yep. So where are you if you have a Bible and it doesn't have science in it? And it removes the blood a bunch. And it doesn't have Lucifer in it. It doesn't have Calvary in it. Where are you? What kind of faith you got? We've got to close here. Any questions real quick that I can... Real quick deal with yes. Why do some people say that it's Satan and Christ The Mormons say that. Why are they doing because they're stupid. <laughs> <laughs> because they're heretics. <laughs>